Our next speaker is Aaron Birch. Uh, Aaron is, uh, has four daughters and uh, he just uh, yesterday has, uh, has a son now. His name is Timothy. His wife, Katie, Katie uh, gave birth to a boy. So we're excited for him uh, and excited for that. Aaron, he is a graduate here of the school. He graduated in 2007, then went on to Freed Hardman and got his degree in 2009. He has taught at the school for uh, a few years and he, t he, he taught the life of Christ, but now he is teaching uh, a New Testament Greek. And, and Aaron's lesson today will be the law, holy righteousness, and God, and, and good. I'm sorry, Romans 7, 7 through 13. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen, for the introduction. Uh, thank you as well to all of you who are here today. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to come and to, to speak and to think with you a little bit about God's Word. Uh, thank you as well to the elders especially and uh, to the lectureship committee for the opportunity to be part of the lectureship. I was thinking... Um, a few moments ago about uh, about Sunday. Sunday I filled in for Will Montgomery and spoke at uh, St. Clair Avenue and uh, on the way to uh, to worship services and teach Bible class the, the girls were giving me a little bit of a hard time. Uh, they kept telling me that uh, I speak a long time. Uh, I guess they think I'm kind of long-winded. And uh, Esther said that I never speak less than two hours. <laughs> I tried to tell her I don't think I've ever spoke two hours. But um, I, uh, I taught Bible class a little bit from the text we're going to look at this morning, which, by the way, if you want to turn there, is Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Uh, when I was in school, uh, Brother Cooper had spoken on the Freed Hardman lectures, and uh, he had spoken a couple weeks beforehand. He had used his lesson. He had preached it uh, at some congregation. I don't remember if he preached it here at Hillview. I think he had went somewhere else, and he had preached it. And Brother Pugh had told us in class, he's like, if you ever speak on a lectureship, that's a good thing to do, is to preach it beforehand. Now, I'll give you a little bit of acquaintance with your material and help you work through it a little bit. And so I've made it a habit of when I have opportunity to speak uh, on a lectureship or I have that kind of material, I use it. And I'll, I'll speak and teach through it or something. And so I did that. I, I used it for Bible class. Well, I made it through probably less than two pages of my notes in summary form in 45 minutes. So if you look at the book, the amount of material I had in the lecture, I probably could speak for two hours. Now, I guess Esther was right, but um, I was looking at the schedule, and I'm scheduled to speak at 11. There's not another speaker until 1.15, so I guess somebody gave me two hours and 15 minutes. I don't know who I's idea it was to do that, but thank you. We'll try not to speak uh, that long, though. I wanted to say as well, too, that I appreciate Dr. Abbey. I'm thankful I got to hear him speak. Uh, every time that I hear him speak, I, I learn something. His, uh, his lessons are so deep and insightful. I appreciate him very much. And I also want to apologize to the other speakers today. Um, Katie did have the baby yesterday morning about 2.51. Uh, I've been up for most of a couple days other than last night, and I'm, I'm still pretty tired, so once I speak, uh, I'm going to head back home. Uh, my, I normally like to come and spend the whole day, uh, but I'm not going to try and do that today, and so I apologize to those who are going to speak later. Uh, but I did appreciate getting to hear Dr. Abby, and I'm thankful for that. A couple of times in the New Testament, uh, Paul tells us that the law has been abolished, or the law has been taken away. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, the law 
the commandments that were against us were nailed to the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, they were nailed there with Him. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 14, and also in verse 15, the middle wall of separation, the divided Jew and Greek, which he goes on in verse 15 to tell us, was the law of commandments. That it was taken down, it was broken down, and it was removed, taken out of the way. In Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 1 through verse 7, Paul states almost the same thing, or roughly the same thing. In fact, in my opinion, perhaps, verse 1 through verse 7 is one of the strongest statements in the New Testament that we are no longer under the law, that the law has been removed. In fact, there are two key terms that Paul uses in verse 1 through verse 7 to tell us about the removal of the law. He tells us, first of all, that we have been delivered from the law. It's been taken away. It's been removed. We're no longer under it. And then he tells us as well that we have died to the law. Look, if you will, at verse 6. He says, but now we, Romans 7 and verse 6, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The few verses prior to this, Paul illustrates the idea of deliverance from the law. He compares it to the relationship of a husband and a wife, specifically to the wife whose husband has died. If she marries another while, she, while her husband lives, she commits adultery. However, if her husband dies, she is delivered from the law of her husband. In other words, she's no longer subject to that law. She's been delivered from it. So that if she marries another, she's not called an adulteress. She's free to marry. Paul makes the point then in verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also... In other words, he's making a comparison between us and the law and the wife and the law of her husband. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. So when Christ died on the cross, He delivered us. He took the law away, the same as Colossians 2 and verse 14 and Ephesians 2 and verse 14 and 15 state. But He goes on to say here that you may be married to another. Just like that woman whose husband has died and can now remarry, we too, through the body of Christ on the cross, are able to marry again. Again, specifically to Him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit for God. In other words, in the first seven verses of chapter 7, Paul points out that we can now serve Christ. We now are no longer subject to the law of Moses, but we are subject to the law of Christ. Now that might bring up a bit of a question. Why? Why were we delivered from the law? Why was it necessary for the law to be removed? An insightful Jewish Christian, or any Jew for that matter, in the first century, might come to the conclusion that what Paul is saying is that the law is evil, that the law is wicked. Paul, if you back up to verse 1, he's talking to people. He says, know the law. Or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law. He's talking to people who have apparently been under the law. It appears to me, or in my opinion it appears, that he's probably talking mainly at this point to Jewish Christians. And certainly they would come to the question, why? What was wrong with the law? Why has it been removed? Our text this morning, verse 7 through verse 13, answers that question. What is the purpose of the law? What is the value of the law? Why was it given? If all that was going to happen was that Christ was going to die on the cross to deliver us from the law, to make us dead to the law, why was it ever given to begin with? Begin with me, if you will, in verse 7. Let's read our text. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. 
On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was once alive without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might be become exceedingly sinful. Paul begins in our text with a question. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly, for an insightful person, that is a possible conclusion to what Paul has said. Certainly, if the law is sin, if the law is evil, if the law is wicked, then we do need to be delivered from it. But from a Jewish standpoint, the idea that the law would be sin or wicked is almost blasphemous. In Acts chapter 6 and in Acts chapter 7, when the Jews eventually stoned Stephen, one of the things that they brought against him was that he spoke against Moses, the law, and this place, talking about Jerusalem, or perhaps more specifically, the temple. For a Jew to say that the law was wicked or sinful was blasphemous. Throughout the Old Testament, the law had been praised. The wise man meditates on the law day and night. The psalmist in Psalm 19 says the law is pure. The law is holy. The testimonies of the law, of the law are good. Far from being wicked, far from being sinful, the law is good. And Paul agrees. He asks this question, is the law sin? And he answers himself, certainly not. This phrase, certainly not, occurs several times in the book of Romans and several times as well throughout the New Testament. It's one of the strongest ways of denying something. The structure of the phrase denies roughly the possibility that something could be. If you're reading from the King James Version, the King James Version translates it as God forbid. The New King James Version translates it as certainly not. Uh, some of the other more modern versions, the New American Standard Bible and the English Standard Version, most of them have something like may it never be. Literally, it's simply may it not be, but it's so much stronger. It's one of the strongest forms in the Greek language to deny that something would occur. In other words, Paul is agreeing with this notion that the law could never be sin. The law could never be wickedness. The law is good. The law is right. The law is holy. So we're left with this question then. Why do we need delivered from the law? Why does the law need to be taken away? Why do we need to consider ourselves dead to the law? It's not because the law is wicked. It's not because the law is evil. Beginning in the latter portion of verse 7, Paul notes a connection. That is, there's a connection between the law and sin. The law itself is not sin. The law is not wickedness. However, there is a relationship, there's a connection between the law and sin that ultimately he's going to say makes it necessary for the law to be removed. He begins in the latter portion of verse 7, and he says, first of all, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Paul's going to talk about several things here in the next couple of verses. One of those things is or involves the role of the law. And part of the role of the law was to make sin known. Paul begins way back in chapter 1 of Romans. 
And he talks about the Gentile world beginning in verse 18. How the Gentile world was lost in sin and basically involved it in itself in every type of sin imaginable. But all the way at the beginning of that section in chapter 1 and verse 18, he says a couple of things that are important in this connection. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, or that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He begins in verse 18, and he says, The wrath of God has been revealed against all ungodliness, against all unrighteousness. But he also says that the creation teaches us about God. In fact, it reveals, the creation reveals certain things about God. It reveals His Godhood, or Godhead, apparently the idea of His divinity, His deity, and His eternal power. Now that tells us that from creation alone, we can know that God exists, we can know that God is, and we can know at least a little bit about Him. If you go on in verse 20, he says it reveals enough about God that the Gentile world was without excuse. In other words, they had no excuse for the sin that they involved themselves in. They had no excuse from turning themselves against God to worship idols. And for that matter, neither do we. We have no excuse. It appears that there are certain things from creation that we should know about God. And I think, or I suspect, that there are certain things as well, certain sins that we ought to know are inherently wrong. It seems to me there, there's something inherently wrong about murdering a person. Does that mean people don't do it? No, they, they do. Uh, does it mean that people can't harden themselves? Perhaps we can turn ourselves so much against God that, that we don't see those things. But, but there's something inherent, something inherently wrong about certain things that, that as Paul would say in chapter 2, that it's like the law is written on our hearts. There's something in our conscience, something in our nature that tells us that's wrong. However, could we have known if God had not spoken, if God had not had men write down exactly what was right and what was wrong, could we have known what God wanted? It's possible, I suppose, that had God not spoken exactly what was right and exactly what was wrong, that some of us, at least, might have come to the conclusion that we weren't too bad. Perhaps we might even come to the conclusion that, that we were pretty good. But the law does something about that. The law reveals sin. It makes known sin. It makes us come to know our sin and reveals to us how sinful we really are. It reveals to us how far we've fallen from God's intended will and from what He wants us to be. Paul says here, back in our passage in chapter 7 and verse 7, he says, For I would not have known covetousness. Covetousness simply means desire, but especially in the Bible, it has a negative connotation, meaning desire of the kind that is an inordinate or evil. Desiring things that we have no right to. Desiring things that belong to someone else. Paul says, I wouldn't have known that. 
I wouldn't have known covetousness had the law not said, you shall not covet. He, of course, is quoting from the Ten Commandments, from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, in which Moses would go on to elaborate, don't covet your neighbor's house, don't covet his wife, don't covet his servants, don't covet his animals. Think about this for a moment. Would we have inherently known that to desire someone else's things was wrong had God not said so? I suspect, as people, we probably wouldn't have thought that's too bad. It's okay for me to desire someone else's things just as long as I don't actually take it. Isn't that kind of the way we think? There are some things that, that we kind of try to nullify the terribleness of. For example, we might tell a lie and we'll call it a white lie. It's just a little one. It's not that bad. Or we might fudge on our taxes and not look at it as theft or stealing. You see, the law reveals sin. It tells us about sin. It tells us the nature of sin. Paul goes on in verse 8 and he says, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Not only does the law tell us exactly what sin is, it in a sense multiplies it. Now, I don't think that Paul means that the law, just by the giving of the law, makes us sin more. Think about it from this standpoint, though. When it makes sin known, when it makes known exactly what is wrong, even those small things like white lies and covetousness, when it makes those things known, it tells us we've done more than what we might have thought we've done. We've sinned more than what we might have thought we've done. We've involved ourselves in sin more than we thought we have. Some think uh, in this particular text that Paul is alluding to, or some suggest perhaps uh, even more than alluding, is specifically referring to Adam and his sin. Uh, as Dr. Abby talked about in the last hour, Paul does refer to Adam in chapter 5, and perhaps he might be alluding to such here. I'm not certain whether he is in this section or not. I think that Paul is simply referring to his own struggle, to his own difficulties. But Adam, I think, is illustrative of what we find. When Adam was first created by God, did he have sin? He didn't, did he? He was sinless. He was pure. In that state... Until God commanded him not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, could he sin? Until the commandment came, I don't really think he could. It's when God commanded him, you shall not eat, that he had a choice. He had to decide, am I going to obey God or am I going to, not going to obey God? And unfortunately, we know what he chose. He chose not to obey God. And because of that, because God told him exactly what was wrong and what was right, and because of his choice, he became more sinful. And because of his choice, choosing to disobey God, he suffered the consequences. The law reveals sin. It reveals the nature of sin, the terribleness of sin, and it reveals the consequences too. But isn't the same thing that happened with Adam true for us? Isn't it true that God gives the command and then we have a choice? We have a choice to obey or not obey. 
that then once we have chosen to disobey, which unfortunately Paul says in chapter 3, all of us do, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all of us of the age of accountability have made the wrong choice, that we all then suffer the consequences. Paul says the law reveals sin. The law produces sin in the sense, I think, that it makes known how terrible we really are. It produces sin in that way. He continues in verse 8 and says, For apart from the law, sin was dead. Verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When Paul reached the age of accountability, Paul made a choice. He had a choice to make. Will I obey or will I disobey? Paul made the wrong choice. And Paul died, spiritually speaking. Verse 10, And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. How was it that Paul knew he was a sinner? How was it that Paul knew that he was so terribly in sin? It was because the law said, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't covet. And Paul found out he did all those things, or at least some of them, and he died. The law, the commandment which he thought was to bring life, he found to bring death. Verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me... And by it, killed me. Notice very closely as we look through these few verses that Paul makes several assertions, that is, direct statements, beginning in the latter portion of verse 7. He says, first, I would not have known sin. If it hadn't been for the law, he would not have known what sin was. For, second assertion, I would not have known covetousness. Without the law, he would not have known what evil desire was. Verse 8, sin produced in me all manner of evil desire. Sin produced more sin. The law, or apart from the law, sin was dead. So notice, the law made sin known. Sin brought more sin. Sin was dead without the law. Verse 9, I was once alive. Sin, in the latter portion of verse 9, revived and I died. The commandment I found to bring death. And verse 11, sin deceived me. Sin killed me. The key to all of those statements, all of those assertions that Paul makes are the prepositional phrases, the modifying clauses that he places with them. And each of those emphasizes the role of the law. The assertions emphasize what happened with sin. The law made sin known. Sin produced sin. Sin was dead without the law. All of those emphasize the role of sin. The modifying phrases emphasize the law. I would not have known covetousness unless the law. Sin, taking opportunity by the commandment. Apart from the law, sin was dead. I was once alive without the law. Notice how he emphasizes this connection. The connection between the law and sin. The law isn't sin. But there is a relationship. There is a relationship between the law and sin. The law makes sin known. The law, in a sense, gives sin power. Because when God gives the command, then we have a choice. Will we obey or will we disobey? Paul, at one time, in verse 9, was alive. If you think about it for a moment, we might ask the question, when was Paul alive? 
if when, as he says here, he says in verse 9, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, the law, the commandments, were given centuries before Paul was ever alive. So how, when the commandment came, did Paul then die? How was he alive before the commandment came? He's talking, of course, from a spiritual standpoint. Paul was not born inherently depraved. Paul did not have original sin. Paul was born sinless. But when he came to the age of accountability, when he came to know what was right and wrong, when he came to understand what the Scriptures said and what the Scriptures told him to do and not to do, then he had a choice. And he, like every other person that has ever lived except for Jesus, made the wrong choice and sinned and spiritually died. Once, without the law, Paul was alive. But when the commandment came, sin revived and he died. Verse 10, the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Sin again, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, that is, by the commandment, killed me. Again, notice the connection. There's a relationship. The law isn't sin, but it is connected with sin in the sense that the law or sin used the law. So we're still left with this question. What? Why? Why are we delivered from the law? Why are we to consider ourselves dead to the law? It's not because the law is sin. In fact, the law isn't sin. The law is simply used by sin. Paul draws a conclusion in verse 12 and verse 13. And essentially, he's going to tell us three things. He's going to tell us, first of all, the law is good. Verse 12, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Far from being evil, far from being wicked, the law is righteous. The law is holy. The law is good. In fact, the law has done everything God intended for it to do. The law is good. But what's the problem? Well, the first part of verse 13. Has then what is good to me, or good, become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Law is good. The law is not, in verse 13, the law is not death. It's not the law that causes our death. It's not the law that brings the consequences of death. Well, what is? What is it that brings death? What is it that has caused us so much problem and so much struggle and so much trial? The key is, but sin. In verse 13. Certainly not but sin. What is it that's evil? What is it that's wicked? What is it that brings us death? What is it that we need delivered from? It's sin. The problem was, the problem is, and the problem always will be sin. Not the law. The law wasn't the problem. The law simply revealed sin. It simply told us what sin was. And it simply told us what the consequences were. That when we sin, we die. The law simply reveals how terrible sin is. Paul continues, he says, But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. You see, the law, when it tells us what's wrong, we start to learn how sinful we are. 
There was a, a sermon written by J.W. McGarvey. It's in his uh, little book entitled McGarvey's Sermons. He talks about sin, and he makes a statement that I think is uh, interesting in this connection. He says, for most of his adult life, he had thought about this concept of sin and tried to imagine how God viewed sin. And he concludes in that little statement, he says, I always come up short. He says, I, I don't understand sin the way God understands sin. There's something about us as people that, that we don't see sin the way God does. Uh, God, of course, is different than us. We're not like Him. The only reason that we know that sin is sinful is because God tells us. But when He has told us in His Word, when He has revealed to us sin, and when He has revealed to us the consequences of sin, we come to what Paul says in verse 13. We come to understand the exceedingly sinful nature of sin. We come to understand, at least to some degree, to our human finite minds, we come to understand some of how God views sin, of how terrible it is in His sight. And we learn how entrenched we are in it. But sadly, we also learn something else. We learn the consequences of it. We learn that the wages of sin, chapter 6 and verse 23, we learn that the wages of sin is death. And we also learn that from the law's standpoint, there's no way out. The law doesn't deliver from sin. Paul begins with this question, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And it comes from how he ends the previous six verses. We need to be delivered from sin, we need to con or from the law, we need to consider ourselves dead to the law. But why? Why do we need to be delivered? Why do we need to consider ourselves dead? He's labored through the last few verses from verse 7 through verse 11 to come to this conclusion to state that it's not the law. It's not because the law was sinful that we need to be delivered from it. And so we're still stuck with this question. Why? Why do we need to be delivered from the law? Paul doesn't specifically state at this point why that is, but it's implicit. It's implicit throughout this text, and, and he's going to come back to the idea later in chapter 7. If you drop down to the end of chapter 7, in verse 24 and verse 25, I think this is key to part of what he's saying here. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Why do I need to be delivered from the law? It's because the law doesn't deliver. Paul would say in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 21, if there ever was a law that could bring light righteousness, certainly righteousness would have come in through the law, that is through the law of Moses. That's kind of one of those negative questions. Sometimes if we don't pay attention, we don't exactly understand what he's saying. But what he's saying is the law couldn't bring righteousness. The law couldn't do it. It was never intended to do it. It was intended to tell us what we did wrong and the consequences of it. So what's going to deliver us? How are we going to be delivered from our sin? The answer is Jesus. Through Jesus, we find deliverance from our sin. That means, however, though, that not only do we need deliverance from sin, but we also need deliverance from the law. Why should we consider ourselves dead? Why should we consider ourselves delivered? It's because we need Jesus. And we need delivered from the consequences of sin. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift in Jesus. And thanks as well be to God for the law. The law tells us we're sinful. The law is good. The law is righteous. The law is holy. And it does exactly what God wanted it to. It tells us where we're wrong. 
but we still need Jesus. This morning, we want to offer the invitation for any who might not have come to Jesus. We offer the invitation so that you can have deliverance from sin and at the same time have deliverance from the law. Not because the law was evil, not because the law was wicked, but because we need deliverance through Jesus. Deliverance from sin. The law tells us that we've done wrong. Each and every one of us. Not one of us is righteous. No, not one. This morning, if you're not a Christian, we implore you to become one. God has paid the price through His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be forgiven of our sins. He allowed His Son to die upon the cross to take our sins away. And He asks for us to obey Him. That is, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. To repent of our sins, that is, to decide to change our ways and go in a different direction. To confess that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, before men. And then to be baptized, that is, immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And through Jesus, we can have deliverance. Deliverance from our sin. Deliverance from our wickedness. If you've not done that, won't you do that today? Won't you come, if you want, to the front, make your need known, and let us baptize you, immerse you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Perhaps you have done that. Or perhaps you've fallen away. The blood of Christ is still available to cleanse us of our sin. God simply asks that we repent of our sins and confess, and He is just and righteous to forgive us. This morning, if you need to become a Christian or if you need to return to Him, won't you do so as we stand and sing the invitation song?